We have a paradox to look into right now. We are given a statement that only the Son of God can know God. And that would leave us without a God unless we are the Son of God. That means that whoever thinks himself or herself to be the Son of God but does not know what that means and is actually not being that Son is living without God. And that would include most of mankind, including born-again Christians. Because being the Son of God and being a human being is impossible. And so we are now going to face a truth that <coughs> is essential to our evolution in spirit. We are either whatever Son of God is, or we are not aware of and under the government of God. Now, to justify this statement, I'd simply read you this first statement of John's, and you'll recognize it instantly, because it's so important that he has placed it even before his story of Jesus. It is preface to the gospel and it goes this way no man hath seen God at any time no man no man no woman no person no mortal being hath seen God at any time now once that has made an impression on us we must then say, well, who has seen God? And what does seeing God mean? Of course, it means to realize the presence of God. No human being can realize the presence of God. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now then, the word only becomes very significant. You would like to consider yourself the Son of God, the <coughs> child of God, and here it says, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of God, he hath declared him. Are you that Son, the only begotten Son? And yet, if you're not, you cannot know God. Now, how can you be the only begotten Son, and someone else be the only begotten Son, and someone else again? if there's only one begotten Son. Something has to be done, or we don't have a God. Do you see why we have to leave the mortal sense of life? In your mortal body, and in his and her mortal bodies, we have three people, or four people, or ten people, or four billion people and only one begotten Son. We have to remove the mask of mortality to see that the only begotten Son is the infinite Christ. And then we have to make the step. If I am not that only infinite begotten Christ, I have no God. And so that's your first hurdle as far as accepting infinity. You either do or you reject God's presence as Father. 
infinite father has one infinite son. Now this is all a matter of what may be called scale. And the reason for this truth being so important to us is that we are now in a state of spiritual evolution. It didn't really stop at all when Darwin discovered what he did more than 150 years or so ago. This natural physical evolution was just an offshoot of the spiritual evolution that has been taking place in the consciousness of mankind since the days of the amoeba. There is a progression in consciousness that is necessary in order to flow with the infinite spiritual power. It's a demand power. It moves and it must progress. And that means spiritual evolution has nothing to oppose it and there's no one who can stand in the way of it. You simply abide by it, move with it, live with it, accept it, and cooperate with it. Your spiritual evolution demands that you move up the ladder, up the scale. You can't stop at mortality. You've got to make a movement upward into a higher level of self, a higher level of consciousness, and this requires the knowledge, first, that you are the infinite Son, the only begotten. Only in this way do you make yourself available to your source. The Father flows only through the Son. Infinity individualizes only through the infinite, only begotten Son. Now that must be you. That is the missing link which in the absence of it we are separated from the source. And so we want to clarify clearly that when John says the only begotten Son, he hath declared the Father, that means that only the Christ the infinite individualization can manifest, reveal, express the infinite Father. Now then, if that is not you, we have nothing to say to each other. We have no progression in spirit. And if it is you, it is time to live as the only begotten. The only begotten stood before the Father and said, And now, O Father, glorify thou me. Mark the next words. With thine own self. With thine own self. Glorify thou me. with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Now this is a statement of yourself to the Father. Not of a second self or a second person or another person. It is a statement of your Christ self to the Father. Glorify thou me. Show that I am your life. Reveal my identity. Show that I am not mortal, that I am not physical, that I am not limited in time and in space. Show who I am. So that all may see who they are. Glorify thou me with thine own self. I want you to undergo 
that experience in such a close relationship with the Father that you can hardly talk about it to anyone else. Your infinite source, your infinite creator, which is ever flowing through and expressing as your infinite self, is always present to glorify you with infinite self when you ask in the name of the only begotten Son. Not a third party, not another only begotten Son, but you, the only begotten Son. Do you do that? Have you accepted yourself to be the only begotten Son without partitions, without divisions? When you do, then you are asking in my name. Then you have supplied the missing link and you are glorified by the one infinite self. This asking is not a matter of words or a temporary attitude, a momentary beseeching, nothing of that nature. Rather, it's a permanent attitude of life. It's the way you live. I, the only begotten Son, I, the individuality, of the Father. I expect to always be glorified by the infinite divine self. For this is the nature of divinity. To glorify itself as the infinite Son. And it is the nature of the Son to be faithful to the infinite Father, not to the imitation sense mind of man, not to the imitation form, not to the so-called temptations of this world. With the glory that I had before the world was, Now you can take that two ways. First, it definitely means that you exist now because you pre-existed. It removes your so-called birth date and it recognizes that your eternal selfhood has always been. Also, before the world was is not necessarily in time. But before there was a concept called world, meaning above this sense of world that we entertain, meaning that you exist above this world now and always have, above world consciousness. Glorify thou me with thine own self. Reveal that I now exist, as always have existed, above the world of human personalities and appearances. With thine own self. Reveal that because I am the only begotten, I must be Christ in Christ consciousness now, even though I appear to human sense as a physical form. And because Christ says, reveal it, it must be so. It isn't something to be attained. 
but to be revealed, to be known, to be recognized, and then to be utilized. Once you accept the existence of your Christ self, the next step is to let it work in you. Now you're not going to accomplish this in one meditation. So you've got to accept in many meditations the nature of your being as the only begotten. That's you. This is your Christ authorization to know and to practice that you are infinite being, the only begotten. And remember, if you are not, what are you? If there's only one begotten, what are we if we are not that one? We're cast adrift. Of course, it's a big jump. But let's try it now together. Let's call it the prayer of self-recognition. And if your soul enters that special area of acceptance, you will recognize it quickly. Because this is how you meet the world mind which is really the only adversary you can ever have. The only way you can ever dissolve the world mind, which is constantly working behind the scenes, is to rise to this acceptance, this consciousness of being the only begotten. For in this consciousness, the world mind has no outlet in you. Remember when he said, the prince of this world cometh and find nothing in me? Because it can find nothing in Christ. Now please, leave your sense of body. The only begotten is not in your body. So let your consciousness roam now through infinity. through all geography. The only begotten stands behind all that is called geography. This is yourself. Behind the pages of history stands the only begotten. Behind eons and eons of time stands the only begotten. And this is your self. Behind every tomorrow, behind every yesterday, not where the little form stands on a little line between today and tomorrow, but in eternity now, in the timelessness of being, in the spacelessness of being stands you, the only begotten, the infinite self. And it declares my identity, my infinity, that I am the only begotten. And then it lives consciously in my awakened consciousness, expressing the Father.
it's very difficult to conceive that only Christ walks the earth knowing that no one is here except my perfect infinite father self no one the only inhabitant is the only begotten that makes us all more than brothers it makes one self without opposite and that is the vital chain of command necessary for you to receive the Holy Ghost actually to send forth the Holy Ghost because the only begotten sends forth the ghost every time you go to John 118 for that statement and you meditate with it you'll see that the only begotten is the image and likeness of God and there's no other image no other likeness of God all of this is symbolism to show you that there is one self one self ever new ever being begotten ever born infinitely new infinitely and that self is yourself now let's go back several thousand years in this so-called time we're, we're not informed now and just rest there before the birth of Jesus Christ for the only begotten existed before the birth of Jesus even Jesus Christ said that he said the father has borne witness of me why don't you believe my works when the father told you all about me he was speaking of the only begotten living expressing being before Abraham before Melchizedek and through Melchizedek and through Hezekiah and through Abraham and through Moses and through all who have walked the path of illumination the only begotten expressing through them is yourself they accepted themselves to be the only begotten Enoch was the only begotten expressing perfectly so it is that if we accept the one self that we are throughout eternity we can no longer say today I am 60 or tomorrow I'll be 70 and in the next 10 years I'll be 80 there simply is no such self you can enjoy your birthdays without accepting the reality of them there is no aging self there is only the one only begotten and it's very important not to walk out of your only begotten self in your belief in your belief you must constantly consciously know I am the only begotten I am the infinite eternal self whatever appearance denies it must be 
an illusion not present, simply appearing to be in the world mind. All that we call history, all of it, is an imitation of my being. All space, all geography, is an imitation of my being. All nature is an imitation of my being because the only reason nature appears here is somewhat similar to the way a, a child, an embryo, appears before it's born, going through all of the recapitulation of its previous realms of life so that in the mother's womb we see various levels of evolution taking place before the child is actually a baby. So with your soul. It too recapitulates your entire past. The entire past of your only begotten self is recapitulated in imitation form. And it becomes oceans, rivers, all of that. This is the soul's recapitulation of its travels through the invisible universe. You may remember some of the older anthologies, the snake, the serpent, where the tail of it comes around in a circle and back to the head, and then the head swallows the tail. That was a symbol of your soul moving through the invisible universe out into the void sowing reaping what it sows rising higher and higher making its evolution through your being through your selfhood and then back to itself back to its point of departure and this is part of its experience, this earth experience. As that soul passes through certain experiences, they are registered in this earth experience is what we call birth and death and a lifespan, almost like shadows in the water. But it's all your soul's activity moving. And as you become more conscious of your only begotten self, this is what stands still. As the soul moves through it, exploring, learning, differentiating, discriminating between reality and unreality reality and conjecture. And so slowly we are being weaned away from this five sense limited linear life. Here you see a thousand miles ahead of you only with the aid of instruments. With the naked eye you don't. There may be a thousand miles ahead of you, but you don't see much of it. And there's a thousand miles behind you, but you don't see much of it either. And there's thousands and thousands of miles each way, and you are the division between them. But you're a false division. There's an ocean, and you go out into the ocean. Now, before you go into it, it's just an ocean. But when you get into it, there's ocean in front and ocean behind. Ocean to the right and ocean to the left. But this is all a false division. It's still the same ocean whether you're in it or not. And it's the same with time. It's an endless eternity in reality, but the moment you step into time, 
The moment you step into the endless reality, it appears to you as time. It becomes time in front of you called tomorrow and time behind you called yesterday. But it's really eternity. Your viewpoint is arbitrary. It only seems that way because you're in the middle of it. Remove you and it's eternity again. We finitize merely by existing as finite beings. And so we live in this linear motion, finitizing automatically. Although we are infinite, eternal, the only begotten self in reality. To come above this finite linear living, this momentary living, this localized living, which is only a five sense experience, this is the next step in our spiritual evolution. That's why you feel this great pull. It's kind of gravity in reverse. But instead of pulling you down, it's pushing you up. It's pushing you against the gravitation of the world mind out of your limited sense of a finite self. Glorify thou me with thine own self. Release my false consciousness from the limitations of a linear mortal type of life which is localized, moving slowly, inch by inch, in space and in time. That's not the Son of God. And this is building soul consciousness, a very necessary step in order to evolve into your first heaven. These chapters here in John, which teach us that we are the only begotten Son in their own spiritual shorthand, have been overlooked. And men, men have been willing to say, I had an inner experience, I had a vision, I saw Jesus, he spoke to me, or something of that nature. And without verifying what they really had, which in many cases is nothing more than some psychic remembrance. They're willing to say, I have been born again. And the sad part of it is that we know so many of our born again people are five minutes later, they, they demonstrate that they're dead again, not born again. One day, uh, you know, it, it's a lot of pretense involved and a lot of ego and sometimes a lot of something else, a lot of wishful thinking. And then when we are born again, it's nothing quite that shallow as just a momentary psychic or even a spiritual experience doesn't make a rebirth. Rebirth is not an instantaneous thing. Rebirth is born out of a way of life, a long, important, total renunciation of that which is not true. You make a mockery out of the Christ teaching when we have a shallow experience called being born again. One woman told me about she saw the grass and it was on fire and it lit up and she lived off of that memory for 20 years thinking she had been born again and usually was in a rather shabby state of misery. We have so many people who hit the headlines and say they were born again. I just want to make the point that the crucifixion indicates the depth of rebirth. 
You can never be reborn again and still be a person. To be reborn is to evolve out of humanhood, flesh, mortality, into the realization of being the only begotten Son. And then that still is only a mirage if there is even one person in this entire universe that you think of in terms of not being the only begotten Son. Because the only begotten Son is infinite and there is no other. You can't have one person left in this world that you consider sick or damaged or in any way insufficient in some respect. There is no such thing in the realization of being the only begotten Son. And so I, I, I want to emphasize that it's, it's not going to be done in, in a short time. And it's only going to be done by those who have found their own inner guidance to take them over many difficult thresholds. But nonetheless, it is the path of righteousness. It is the path of Christ consciousness. And it is clear that this was the consciousness of the Christ called Jesus who had accepted himself to be the only begotten Son and said, As I am, thou art. I am the light, and ye are the light. And so it was very clear that the only begotten Son was not confined to Jesus. For John was also the only begotten Son, and many who preceded Jesus, and some who have followed Jesus. If you knew me, says the Christ, you would know my Father also. Now then, that is a restatement of the previous truth that only when you know Christ the only begotten Son can you know the Father if you knew me you would have known the Father also he's saying this to a group of people who thought they knew God and teaching us through them that they cannot know God because they do not know themselves to be the only begotten Son. And the one saying this is the only begotten Son. If you knew me, the only begotten Son, as yourself, you would also know the Father. And so if there are 75 people here who each think of themselves as people, Where's the only begotten Son? The only begotten Son, of course, is spirit, not flesh. Eternal spirit, not temporary flesh. And so it's a demand again to renounce the false sense of identification and all that goes with it in your lifestyle. So that in accepting the only begotten Son, you are accepting infinite spirit as your name. On April 15th, you still make out tax reforms and render unto Caesar. But at the same time, you render unto God what is God's, with the full knowledge that all that exists is the spiritual creation. Now think for a second of something that you may never have thought of in all your days. Suppose we were to say to you, would you willingly have given away, or let's say would you give away your next 20 years? Would you give it away? Just take the next 20 years and give it away to someone else. 
or just discard it as if it didn't exist. And you say, well, what silliness is that? And I'd agree. Then why do we give away all of the so-called years that we think are past? Suppose those last 60 years, or even the last 6 million years, were still alive. Would you care to claim them and live in them actually and actively? We have given away our entire past in the false belief that it is non-existent. There is no such thing as a dead past. It's an illusion. There's not even a past. That's an illusion. Is God past? Is there a God that's dead in yesterdays? Or is God living in all of our so-called false beliefs in yesterday? When we look back over thousands of miles that we can't see, aren't the miles there? When we look ahead to thousands of miles we can't see, aren't the miles there? Isn't eternity just as far back that way in the past as it is ahead in the future? Isn't God in all of it? Isn't the only begotten Son in all of it? We don't have a dead past. We have a living now which we think of as a dead past. You can reclaim every one of those years. As a matter of fact, you must. There is no such thing as all of yesterday's that have died and now I'm living in today and I'm waiting and going to live in tomorrow. That's just a false horizon in both directions. You never have gone through those years any more than you're going through this year. The only begotten Son is eternal being. And in your meditations, you can live in all of those years simply by accepting the fullness of your being, the aliveness of God everywhere in eternity and in inf infinity. And of course, when you do this, I think I would give the name to that exercise of stretching. We'll call it that, a stretching exercise in which you stretch your awareness that yesterday never died. That was a concept we entertained as a mortal being. For Christ, that was not true. That is why the Father receives the invocation from Christ, and now glorify thou me with thine own self, the self that is eternal and has no yesterdays, has only the livingness of what we call past time. Reveal that I am alive everywhere now and accept it. And as you accept it, something happens again in your soul. Because this is your soul awakening your consciousness to the truth of your being so that you stop pinning yourself down to this moment and think that every moment is going into the past. It isn't. You find this in many of the writings as living now. But it's important for you to see that this now is the permanent now. It's not the passing now. And the begotten son lives in the permanent now. It's important to do this because it is a wiping away of many cobwebs, crystallized thoughts that you really never thought through but simply accepted as a, in a passive way. It's just as important as washing your laundry. It's scrubbing out your consciousness making your consciousness not a place of merchandise. It's cleansing the temple of your consciousness so that wherever you look in time and beyond, you accept your living life now without age, without decay, without the possibility of ever diminishing in power for it is all God life. 
These are all necessary for your spiritual evolution into the first heaven. That is why John has placed them in his gospel. That is why Christ spoke those words. That is why the Father spoke them through Christ for John to put them in his gospel. And for you and I, to be joined to that consciousness by the understanding of their significance in our spiritual evolution. This is like the sap through the tree. If you stop it, you kill the tree. If you stop this force of spiritual evolution in you by turning away, you die. Because it is life, and its demand is evolve. Move upward. You've been to the lower realms. You're in the midway point called Earth. You're on your way to the first heaven. And this gravitational pull in reverse, saying to each of us, follow that Christ of your own being into your next realm. You are becoming a new species. A species unknown to man, higher than man, before the world was, above man, above world consciousness. And nothing can stop this species from existing. It's a requirement in the progression of spirit, or else we are a stagnation, which must be pruned and withered and cast into the fire. This is why we feel this tremendous urge at all times, this yearning. Spiritual evolution is working through you, making its demands, and Christ is the teacher, and Christ is the student, and Christ is the expression. And so your thoughts become not centered in a daily human life. Your whole focus is different. When we started our seminar, we had one meditation, Divine Consciousness is here. And that was to turn you consciously and subconsciously away from human me. And to start a habit in which you do not begin a day in human me. Because that won't evolve. Human me will never evolve. You can't evolve an illusion. Now, when you started your morning today, you probably had a little different morning than usually. At any rate, if it was a human morning, it was not in the kingdom of God. But the only begotten Son lives in the kingdom of God. And this is where we must now live. We live in the kingdom of God. Where the world thinks the world is, we live in the kingdom of God, not in the world. For spiritual fruitage, you must live in the spirit, as the spirit. And so your secret name is the only begotten. And it doesn't matter if you're called Peter instead of Simon or whatever name you may be given from within. You are the only begotten. And infinity is your father. And every time you forget it, you're stopping the flow of the force that is taking you home to reality. I like that stretching exercise to become part of your spiritual vocabulary part of your exercises. And by stretching, I mean stretching your knowledge of who you are. Stretching it beyond known margins of the mind. So that every time you take it into an exercise, you don't relinquish that exercise until you have made a further penetration in some direction. 
maybe you know you have certain human weaknesses and maybe one of them is that in some way you don't have the capacity to love as you'd like to you look for rewards maybe or you love certain people or in some way you find you just can't flow to some people and maybe you'd like to and want to but don't know how and that's because you try to do it as a human being so stretch take the exercise and apply it to your inability to let yourself flow with love but do it as the only begotten and you'll see that you are the sun that shines you can't hold it back you have no power to hold it back as the only begotten as a human being you try to send it out as the only begotten there's no way to stop it that's the nature of Christ and so when you find you don't have the capacity to do certain things that are the nature of Christ that should be telling you there's something in you not accepting yourself to be that only begotten when you find yourself in a narrow state of mind a little selfish at times clinging to something that maybe someone else ought to have and could do better with than yourself go back into this I am the only begotten and see what it does you might be surprised how independent of your mortal thought it just goes right out and does the very thing you would never have dreamed of doing and then you're happy because you know it was right you find a whole different way of stretching once you think of it that way there are many directions in which you can stretch knowing the qualities of the only begotten are your qualities and that every time you stretch further in one direction or another you are expressing infinity and the secret is that the more you express infinity the more of it pours into you I know some are saying maybe that's why I've had certain lacks and deprivations in certain areas I was acting as Niagara Falls instead of realizing that I was Lake Erie I was wanting someone to give it to me I wasn't ready to let it flow out from me to them and so practice this because it is the Christ way to let infinity flow and stretch in as many directions as you can in the new directions until it's a comfortable way of meditating another way I'd like to teach you or talk about with you is another method that I'd like to call sliding besides stretching this sliding is very interesting it has many facets first you slide behind your thoughts you find that you establish a, a knowingness which seems to be separated from your thinking apparatus so I call it sliding because you get behind your thinking apparatus even while it's thinking it's like peeking at your mind you slide behind your thoughts now while you're behind them if you get the feeling of it you feel like you've swallowed a mouse or a, a canary or whatever you call it real good like a cat swallowing a mouse you realize you're in something that's very very important it's another groove and then while you're in that groove there seems to be some inner changing like in your metabolism it's a sort of a funny knitting feeling and you can almost feel that in some way I'm spying on my own mind now it can't get away with anything I'm behind it and pretty soon I'm a little above it and you'll find this you that has slid behind your mind is some sort of soul perception 
It's very delicate to get into that spot, but very rewarding when you do. When you do, you find you've just begun. Because if I'm behind my own thought now, my thought doesn't control me. I can be detached from thought. I can watch thought. I can even say to thought, you don't move me. I don't have to react to you. And then I find there are no thoughts to restrain me. I can slide right out of form. The only thing that keeps me in form is thought. And if I'm behind my thought, I can now slide out of form. You can slide out of material concepts. And you'll catch the technique of sliding when you do it consciously, and suddenly you hit that groove, almost like a transmission box coming into from first to second or second to third. You get into that groove and you feel something different. You feel you're in a control box, and you're the control. Pretty soon you're not in mortal thought. And that's where all the damage is done, in mortal thought, false beliefs, thoughts that are not the thoughts of God. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Slide behind your thoughts. Make an exercise of it every now and then. One day, when you least expect it, you'll find you're already there before you even try to be. And then there's a different freedom you're no longer pivoted down to a, a form, a place. You're not a point of geography. Yet a little while, says the Master, and the world will see me no more. This is before the truth before Gethsemane. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more. But ye will behold me. He's talking to people, disciples, men who appear as flesh. The world won't behold me, but you will. What made them so special that they could behold him, but the world couldn't? They were going to slide behind mortal thought. They weren't going to look out with human eyes and see him. But the point is, who are they going to see? He even says something more important than that. Because I live, ye shall live. And therefore Christ is saying to us, because I, Christ, live, ye shall live. This Christ, which is moving into an appearance of crucifixion, says, Because I live, ye shall live. In other words, this illusion called death coming up, that's your mortal thought. Slide behind it. Because I live, not I die. And because I am life itself, because I am the only begotten, ye shall live, because ye are the only begotten. We are the same self. One self is being taught in that statement, because I live, ye shall live. That which is the eternal Christ is saying, you are the eternal Christ. But it is not speaking of your mortal selfhood. It is speaking of that self which knows it is not this little local creature but is now an eternal being and that must become higher in our conscious awareness because Christ lives you must live there's no other self the disciples were at a great disadvantage they still had a Jesus. This was a puzzlement to them. But on the cross there was revealed 
something other than Jesus. And we don't have that disadvantage. We know that the invisible begotten Son is all that was present anywhere. There was no one else. In this world it appears that way. But in the first heaven you will see that there was no one else. Only the one infinite begotten Son. And we will know that now to make our entry. Because the only begotten Son lives, ye shall live because it is you. And if this were not spoken to other disciples, we could not know this. But they were no different than we are. Again, the level of acceptance determines the experience. If you waver, if you doubt, your experience will reflect that wavering and that doubt. If there's something in you that can slide behind mortal thought and accept, that something is your soul awareness. And it will take you the rest of the way. Whatever you shall ask the Father in my name, he shall give you. My name is the only begotten Son, the infinite Son. Asking in my name means knowing yourself to be the infinite Son. Knowing is asking. And just the knowing attains the full flow of infinity into your conscious experience. Now please listen to this very carefully because it should eliminate even the merest shadow of uncertainty in your mind. The thrust of everything we have learned so far is that infinity, infinite life individualizes as your life, and that your life and infinite life are one and the same expression. And here is the statement to you that this is the truth which you can depend on. For, as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. And there is a statement of one divine life. The same life for the Father, the same life for the Son. The one continuous infinite life. Who made that statement? The Christ speaking as the Father. For the Christ has said, I speak nothing of myself but what the Father tells me. So God says directly to you, my life individualizes as your life. And if you don't understand it, read it again and again and meditate it on it again and again until something in you says, I understand it, it is so. Now that life has no age. That life has no beginning. That life knows nothing about human tomorrows which come and go. 
that life is already existent where every human tomorrow seems to be. And it is your life. And I say live it and go back into eternity in all directions and realize the presence of your life everywhere. And you'll find that that stretching brings into play that life in ways we know not of, as the Master said, will do greater works that ye may marvel. The greater works are merely the realization of your own infinite being coming into consciousness. That's the greater work. The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead, and it means those in flesh, when the dead, those in flesh are considered dead because they're stagnant. They're not spiritually alive. The hour is coming and now is when the dead, when the mortal in flesh, will hear the voice of the Son of God. And to hear the voice of the Son of God is to know it is I. I am that Son of God. And those who hear will live, will enter the first heaven. I think this is the verification, if we ever needed one, that transition is the only way you can move in this work in order to meet the requirement of spirit, which says, be ye reborn of the spirit. You cannot allow yourself to rest in mortal stagnation. You must move up the ladder of spirit. By accepting life, by accepting infinity, by accepting yourself to be the only begotten infinite life of the Father, and now letting your conscious awareness of that truth be expanded by daily practice and acknowledgement of it so that invisible doorways open to you that no one can open for you. Only your own inner probing, your own inner resting, your own inner receptivity. But this is the way you move in order to open that receptivity. The acceptance of the truth is the key in the lock. And then the truth activates itself in the consciousness that accepted it. We are being told that our birthplace was in paradise. <coughs> which is another way of saying that we were really never born. But having been born in paradise, having been existent before the world was, our return to that knowledge is our return to paradise. It's not a fiction. It's not a, a script for TV. It's the way things are. And each one of us has the opportunity, none more than the other, no matter what our past has been in this world or any previous world, we each have the equal opportunity to return to paradise, to our birthplace, to our reality. Born in paradise, reborn in paradise. It's probably the only thing that makes this life a total fulfillment 
beyond the normal human success. It gives you everything that this life has to offer, plus opening the doorway to another fuller, more fulfilling, innerly satisfying life that fulfills your divine self as well as your human sense of self. Now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was, but also listen to this. I pray for them, them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. The glorification of Christ Jesus was merely to show the way to the glorification of mankind. And that glorification is identity. I was given a passage before I sat down and I looked it up. And I find that it's a sort of a summation of what our lesson was tonight. It's in Revelation 3.14. Unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, and this is now about the nature of Christ. These things said the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. Christ is the beginning of the creation of God. Your only begotten self is the beginning of the creation of God. If you are not conscious of the beginning of the creation of God as yourself, for you, there is no creation of God. And that's the importance of this statement, that Christ is the beginning of the creation of God, and Christ is you, and Christ is the only begotten Son, and only the Christ, the only begotten Son, is one with the Father. And that is why John originally told us, none can know, no man can know God or see God. Only the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Only the creation of God, the beginning of that creation, knows God. And therefore, Without yourself being that beginning, you're the branch cut off. And so, we're holding our consciousness at that high level. Divine consciousness is present. Infinity is its name. It is expressing infinitely as the sun. That sun is the only sun. There is no second. There is no second self anywhere. And if you are going to let the wayward mind go off into the belief in second selves anywhere, you are that prodigal who has left the father's house. Now, we've done that too many centuries. So at this point, it's holding the consciousness at the level of knowing that not only am I the only begotten and my neighbor too, but there is no other self anywhere in the universe. A 
I told you it would be difficult to come to the place where you could say, I am the only. But as we learn more and more, you'll find you can, with inner justification and assurance, finally make the statement, I am the only, because the only is infinite and there is no second. I would say that if you could now get into a spiritual position where you can make the request within that you are aware of the nature of being and the need for spiritual evolvement and that you will abide by the requirements of spiritual evolution letting the force evolve itself just as the leaf lets the sap move through it without asking for more or directing the sap, telling it where to come, but simply awaiting the fullness of the tree, knowing that every leaf on the tree is going to be taken care of. If you will accept that because you are spiritual being in a state of consciousness evolving to higher realms that there is a force at work doing this within you now and try to in some way not interfere with that force you'll become conscious of it and you'll become conscious of yourself as that force and you will eliminate the second or dual consciousness which has always been trying to play traffic cop and direct the spirit instead of letting the spirit do its own thing. We're tying our hands behind our back. We're tying our thoughts. We're sliding behind them. We're resting in the word. We're watching our own being evolve. That's where we are on this Friday. Could we close with a quiet time? Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Contact us if you need further spiritual assistance. Our premium audios are now available on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple, and Google Podcasts. Please search for Master Spiritual Awareness. Thank you.